Let's take a look at Linus Torvald's thoughts on a hardware industry shift from CPUs to GPUs and AI-driven hardware, what the mix of this impact of AI is on the kernel development, and why AI tools may or may not help replace real maintainers. This is from a recent onstage conversation as Lena sits down with Dirk, who is the head of open source efforts at Verizon, to talk about AI and hardware and how it's changing Linux as a whole. Let's get into what Linus really thinks about AI. If we look at the major changes in the industry, I think one of the biggest changes is on the hardware side, right? Yep. We, for decades and decades, was all about the CPU, and that's all everyone talked about, who has the fastest CPU, the best architecture. And in the last few years, with NVIDIA and less so some other companies like AMD, uh, have really taken the, the spotlight with, with the, depending which artificial term you want to use, the APUs, the uh, accelerated processors. And what is interesting is that while all of this talks to Linux machines, yep. it's actually not Linux that is running on these processors. So how do you think about that evolution that the, the center of the hardware attention actually moved away from us? I, I don't see it that way. So uh, partly because I still think that the most interesting part is the general purpose CPU. It may not get the news so much because it's been around forever and it is what it is and, and people kind of take it for granted. And uh, Linux is there to do all the maintenance and the bring up and the like all the UIs and everything that you kind of expect from a system. And then you have the AI side that does the new darling of the industry and, and that's fine and it's completely, well, it's not completely separate, but it's a, a different kind of environment that Linux helps foster and helps bring about, but that I don't feel that the kernel necessarily needs to be a hugely integral part of. Yeah, I mean, Linux is obviously the launch pad where all of the interaction happens, but the the software that drives this hardware for the first time in decades is now, again, predominantly proprietary. The, the yeah. microkernel running on the GPUs, uh, a software stack like CUDA on top, that's all proprietary software. But that's, to me, as a kernel person, that's really no different from user space. Yeah. So that has always been true that uh, while I personally love open source and I would not want to be involved in any project that isn't open source, to me, it has never been religion, right? So I do open source and Linux is open source, but people have always run uh, commercial applications on top of Linux, uh, whether they be big databases, whether they be cloud services, anything like that. And, uh, and that's, that's normal. And the GPU is just, to me, a different form of the same thing where, where you run your AI workload on top of the kernel and the fact that it has its own, own system for maintaining the, the hard GPU hardware is not something Linux generally worries about too much. We do actually get involved to some degree. There's a lot of resource management that um, virtual memory handling, things like that, where where the kernel is intimately involved. And, uh, and that has actually been one of the nice parts of AI is it made NVIDIA be a, a good player in the Linux kernel space. Uh, famously not true 20 years ago. These days, when, when Linux has been so important to the AI cloud, uh, suddenly NVIDIA cares deeply about Linux, and we have a lot of kernel maintainers from, from, from that quarter, too. So that has been one of the positive sides of, of the AI boom. I, I think it's a very positive thing. Every time a vendor embraces what we do and engages, yeah. that's great. But now you've said AI so many times, I, I have to talk a little bit about that. It's all your fault. Uh, last year, we talked about the idea that AIs could be useful or Gen AI could be useful for code review, for explaining code. And I know uh, uh, quite a bit of work has been done in the, in the Linux kernel community around that. Yeah. Where do you think this is today? 
Well, it's not there to I mean, we're, we have people who are doing a lot of work in using AI, mainly to help maintainers deal with the flow of patches and, and backporting patches to stable versions and things like that. Uh, honestly, from a practical standpoint, a lot of that is experimental. And the big issues we see is that AI has been very disruptive to a lot of our infrastructure. So we have we have the AI crawlers that crawl all over the kernel.org source infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And, and that has been a huge pain uh, and not always pleasant. So there's there's some good and some bad. Um, I, I'm still very much, I'm looking forward to the day when AI is less hyped and more like the everyday reality that nobody talks constantly about. And that's clearly still a few years I, uh, from now. I think exciting new technologies are always what people want to talk about. And of course, with the trillions of dollars being invested, there is, there is a lot of, of curiosity. But one of the things that, that I found interesting in, in Amsterdam at the Open Source Summit there, Daniel Stenberg from LibCurl talked about how the AI-generated uh, slop security submission, security reports, are almost the denial of service attack on his project. Yep. And is this something that you see? We have seen it on the kernel side. We have not seen it to, to that degree. Mm -hmm. But we do see uh, bug reports and security uh, notices that are clearly basically made up by people who misuse AI. And, and it does take resources away mm -hmm. from maintainers. Um, it has been a bigger problem in, in some other projects than it has been for the kernel. Uh, oh, that's great. <laughs> so the other use, of course, that everyone wants to talk about is AI for code generation. So yep. I, I always talk about autocorrect on steroids because AI is fantastic at code completion, at helping you with syntax, with standard libraries. And then at the other end of the spectrum, what today is talked about is agentic AI. So basically having uh, an AI agent to, to which you say, hey, Claude, I want you to develop this feature all the way to people saying in a week with the help of one of those AIs, I built a complete product. Are you playing with this at all? Um, I'm not playing with it at all. I'm sure people are, are looking at it even for the kernel code base. Um, I suspect the kernel is insular and different enough that despite us having a lot of code in the open that you can use to teach AI, it doesn't tend to be, I mean, I, I don't think a lot of people are doing vibe coding for the kernel. I think people are doing vibe coding for own small personal projects. And I actually think, I see that as mostly a, a, a positive thing. I, I just think of how when I grew up, I have a hard time seeing people, but I'm guessing not a lot of the people in the audience grew up with computers and, and reading magazines and typing in programs from computer magazines 45, 50 years ago. Yeah. No hands came up <laughs> onto that. Uh, but that's, that's how I got into computers. And I feel like uh, computers have gotten so complicated and your expectations of programming have gone so much higher that it's much harder to get started these days than it was when I was young and I got into computers and I got excited about it. And I actually think that vibe coding may be a horrible, horrible idea from a maintenance standpoint if you actually try to make a product for it. But I think it's a great way to to make for new people to, to get involved and get excited about computers and get computers to do something that maybe they couldn't yeah. do otherwise. And so I actually am fairly positive about, about this all. And I mean, and that's really ignoring all the people who then hope to make billion dollar companies by just using vibe coding. But, uh, I, I see it as something exciting and something new and something good, even if clearly uh, I think people's expectations from uh, when I talked earlier about how 
real projects are a lot about maintaining it. And uh, I, I think people will notice that pipe coding may not be the way towards that. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously, there is this thrill, the excitement of coming in into a new programming language, a new environment, yeah. a new set of libraries, and have the tool do 90% of the work. Yeah. But I've been spending a lot of time on this, and uh, the tools get you to 90%, and they do an amazing job at that. It's that last 10%. And that last 10% is... That last 10% is the thing that takes 34 years out of your 35-year project. So. Exactly. Thanks to the Linux Foundation for hosting this conference and conversation. If you found this conversation interesting between Linus and Dirk, especially everything around AI and the future of hardware, check out the full talk linked in the description below. Let me know what you think about large language models and AI being introduced into the Linux kernel programming process. Has AI been causing a disruption to the Linux kernel? You made it to the end of the video. You're a true fan. Don't forget to subscribe below and smash that like button on the way back up. Join me and a great community on Discord, and I'll catch you in the next video. Thanks for watching.